most of the problems that religion and the various philosophical movements down through the centuries have produced have been errors because that's where they started. That God is a distinct separate being from us to whom I must offer worship, whom I must cultivate, humor, please and hope to attain a reward from at the very end of my life. That is not what God is. That is a blasphemy. God is such a broad thing, um, some parts of which, most of the parts of which that, that are associated with organized religion is something that I sort of recoil at and something that I think has done a lot of harm to the world, done harm to women, done harm to oppressed peoples, done harm to the World Trade Center. And yet, at the same point, we have the epitome of a great science. The closest science has ever come to explaining Jesus' interpretation that the mustard seed was larger than the kingdom of heaven. And the only science that can fit into that analogy is quantum physics. Now, we have, we have great technology from anti-gravity magnets and magnetic fields of zero point energy. We have all that and we still have this ugly, superstitious, backwater concept of God. People fall into line very readily when they're threatened by these cosmic sentences of everlasting punishment. But this is not how God is. And once you start to question the traditional images, caricatures of God, people feel you're an, an agnostic or an atheist or a subverter of the social order. God must be greater than the greatest of human weaknesses. And indeed, the greatness of human skill, that God must even transcend a most remarkable to emulate nature in its absolute splendor. How can any man or woman sin against such a greatness of mine? How can any one little carbon unit on earth in the backwaters of indeed the Milky Way, the boondocks, betray God Almighty? That is impossible. The height of arrogance is the height of control of those who create God in their own image. I now present to you Mr. and Mrs. Richard Buck Filipowski. Rain, when it fires its thoughts, is likened unto the landscape of a thundercloud. And the synaptic cleft is the sky between the storm and the earth, the earth receptor site. And you see this foreboding dark cloud boiling in the sky. And you see electrical impulses moving through it veins of electric light and then you see it hit the ground. Rain looks like a thunderstorm when it is presenting a coherent thought. So no one has ever seen the thought. What they do see in neural physics is that they see a storm raging around different quadrants of the brain. Those are areas that are mapped in the body and what the person must be responding to. A holographic image. 
rage, murder, hate, compassion, love. The brain does not know the difference between what it sees in its environment and what it remembers because the same specific neural nets are then firing. The brain is made up of tiny nerve cells called neurons. These neurons have tiny branches that reach out and connect to other neurons to form a neural net. Each place where they connect is integrated into a thought or a memory. Now the brain builds up all its concepts by the law of associative memory. For example, ideas, thoughts and feelings are all constructed and interconnected in this neural net and all have a possible relationship with one another. The concept and the feeling of love, for instance, is stored in this vast neural net. But we build the concept of love from many other different ideas. Some people have love connected to disappointment. When they think about love, they experience the memory of pain, sorrow, anger, and even rage. Rage may be linked to hurt, which may be linked to a specific person, which then is connected back to love. We build up models of how we see the world outside of us. And the more information that we have, the more we refine our model one way or another. And what we ultimately do is tell ourselves a story about what the outside world is. Any information that we process, any information that we take in from the environment is always colored by the experiences that we've had and an emotional response that we're having to what we're bringing in. Who is in the driver's seat when we control our emotions or we respond to our emotions? We know physiologically that nerve cells that fire together wire together. If you practice something over and over again, those nerve cells have a long-term relationship. If you get angry on a daily basis, if you get frustrated on a daily basis, if you suffer on a daily basis, if you give reasons for the victimization in your life, you're rewiring and reintegrating that neural net on a daily basis, and that neural net now has a long-term relationship with all those other nerve cells called an identity. We also know that nerve cells that don't fire together no longer wire together. They lose their long-term relationship because every time we interrupt the thought process that produces a chemical response in the body, every time we interrupt it, those nerve cells that are connected to each other start breaking the long-term relationship. When we start interrupting and observing not by stimulus and response and that automatic reaction, but by observing the effects it takes, then we are no longer the body, mind, conscious, emotional person that's responding to its environment as if it is automatic. Does that mean emotions are good or emotions are bad? No, emotions are designed so that it reinforces chemically something into long-term memory. That's why we have them. 